Look, let's get this out of the way immediately. I am white. Very white. I cannot speak on the cultural experience that was this beef. I highly recommend watching FD Signifiers and Lil Bill's video essays that they made during the whole battle. I'm just here because I can't get any of this out of my head. It has been four months and I still wake up with Like That in my head, or rapping Euphoria while taking a shower, or singing Not Like Us while I'm at work. Nor can I stop thinking about how Drake's end of the beef was and how he embarrassed himself. So yes, this is the millionth video on this beef, four months after it happened, but I'm doing this one for me in hopes that I can stop this obsession. Think I won't drop the location, I still got PTSD. Motherfuck the big three. Nigga, it's just big me, nigga. Boom. I don't need to explain the history between Kendrick and Drake's 11-year-old beef and what finally brought us this verse. We already know that. Plus, every video that I've watched goes over this entire thing, and I don't want to be the person that repeats it for the thousandth time. I just want to talk about these songs. So jumping right into the verse itself, because honestly, that's the only part I ever listened to. Amazing. I remember when this verse dropped and hearing such an explicit diss towards Drake by who I consider to be the GOAT got me so hyped up. Oh uh, yeah, I should probably mention this video is going to be heavily biased. <laughs> I do not like Drake. Haven't for years. From the insecure misogyny on Hotline Bling to Millie Bobby Brown, Billie Eilish, and the 17-year-old on stage, finding out he's a deadbeat also added to it. Wasn't much of a fan of the music either, aside from a catchy chorus or when God's Plan became a meme. I wasn't interested, and Drake as a person seemed quite shit enough for me to not like him. Kendrick, on the other hand, I loved Damn during my first year of high school. Handful of singles or noteworthy songs were on my playlist for years. Went on a binge of his music during the pandemic and appreciated him even more as an artist. Been calling him the GOAT for years. So yeah, I was on Kenny's side for the whole beef. And the music, most importantly the lyrics, held up immensely. Yes, I'm going to mostly focus on the lyrics for a rap beef video. That's part of doing this. Part of the fun. You gotta come in with memorable or scathing bars, and there's enough on like that, which is only a 27-line verse. There's the iconic motherfuck the big three, it's just big me. Kendra constantly shouting, Bum! And the pet cemetery bar. I also liked I Hope and Sentiment Symbolic, which could be aimed towards many things. Drake and J. Cole being in the big three, Cole calling himself Muhammad Ali, or the constant times that Drake compares himself to Michael Jackson. My temperament's bipolar, I choose violence. I mean, yeah. He did choose violence. <laughs> the wordplay and clicking up, it cannot be legit, no 40 water is great, even though I need genius to explain said wordplay to me because I don't know E40, be legit, or the click. The part where he says he dissed Melly Mel if he had to always reminds me of that garbage diss Melly Mel made towards Eminem, but also the fact that the Grandmaster Flash and Furious 5 is an iconic hip-hop group really shows the kind of mentality that Kendrick was in at the time. And seeing the way he just kept burying Drake into the ground proves it. Again, this is a great little verse that got me hyped to see what would come in the future from Kendrick. There's not much else to say given how short-lasting it is. It's only a minute long and we're looking at four to six, seven minute long songs for the rest of the beef. But yeah, great verse. So three weeks after the like that verse, I'm at work and just got put onto my break. I sit down, load up YouTube, and see that Rick Ross dropped a diss track towards Drake, and Drake dropped a response diss to like that. The Rick Ross track is fine. I find the whole outro of him just constantly saying white boy to be kind of funny. Got more money than you. Fuck you want me to say 50 mils for the crib where you want me to stay but other than that it's just a standard ross track that doesn't even get into drake until the second verse but then there's push-ups people like this track and i guess it's great to drake standards that he sounds very energetic and ready to fight this battle i mean i guess I can hear a bit of that gassed up energy, but it doesn't stop from the song still being fucking boring. If we go back to like that, Kendrick is constantly switching his flows, deliveries, and rhyme schemes, not letting anything stay around for more than a few bars. It's always changing, which keeps it exciting. You got rhyme schemes inside the bars like sentiments and temperament. I'm pretty sure he manages to make buried and cemetery rhyme. Then you look at push-ups and dear god does Drake make a basic ass rhyme scheme overstay its welcome. It took five people to write fan hand nan japan or what's up cook up shook up push-ups or wipe down right now right down tight now hike down. And yeah by the time the song was leaked there had already been a ton of people coming out and dissing Drake so in a way I get why a lot of the song isn't just focusing solely on Kendrick. I can barely even talk about the bars on this because going through the verse, I'm finding barely nothing. There's like two on here that are fine. Those being how the fuck you big stepping with a size seven men's on and what's a prince to a king, he is son. 
with the latter being some pretty decent wordplay and the former just being one of the many short jokes Drake uses on these tracks. And yes, being 5'5 five five myself, I'm not the biggest fan of hearing these short bars, especially when finding out Kendrick was 5'6 was something that made me feel a lot more comfortable and less insecure with my height, but we already knew this video was heavily biased. Outside of those two bars, dear lord, there are some that are just laughably bad. The way you do in splits, bitch, your pants might rip? I cannot say without sounding like Anthony Fantano reading off a nav line. It's one of the corniest bars I've ever heard, and I'm a Logic fan. And I've wrote some corny ass shit in my time. <laughs> the weird tangent he makes towards Kendrick doing features for Maroon 5 and Taylor Swift when we all know damn well Drake would give anything in the world to do a feature verse for one of those artists. Not to mention this is throwing stones in a glass house. The artist is more of a pop star than a rapper trying to diss the man who made to pimp a butterfly because he was on a Taylor Swift song is just laughable. I also have no idea what Drake's obsession with Taylor Swift is in this beef. Writing this, I have the genius page for this song up, and I just noticed that the You Might Also Like section, <laughs> it's got two Taylor Swift songs. And then my favorite, You Ain't No Big Three, SZA Got You Wiped Down, Travis Got You Wiped Down, Savage Got You Wiped Down. First of all, Travis Scott in 21 Savage is nowhere near the level of Kendrick. Yeah, Travis made Cloud Rap popular and has a couple classics in his catalogs with a couple songs I like. And I do like how Dead Inside 21 Savage sounds, which adds to his aesthetic and what he usually raps about. But I don't think either of them could create Good Kid Mad City or To Pimp a Butterfly or even Mr. Morale. Kendrick's level of writing, wordplay, storytelling, and poetry has both those guys beat. But Drake leads these off by mentioning fucking SZA. Now I like SZA, Kill Bill and Lil are bops, but she's not a rapper. D D Drake. Mentioned this by trying to say like, Oh, Kendrick's so not in the big three that a singer is better than him. I, I mean, I, I guess you could try to say that, but you still sound like a fool saying it. I don't really get the big difference between Mike then and Mike now bar when Drake's the one comparing himself to Michael Jackson while Kendrick's comparing himself to Prince. If this was trying to be another shot at Kendrick, it just fails. That random line of, that song y'all got did not start the beef with us, sounds like he's just trying to explain to his audience that the two have been beefing before this, which we already knew. And Drake, need I remind you that you were the only one mentioned in the control verse that got butthurt. If anything, you started all this, but I digress. There's a random Kais in that mention that I find funny because Genius tries to tell me this is another diss towards Kendrick for Interscope supposedly begged Kai to stream with Kendrick, but then follows that up with 21 Savage did a stream with Kai Sinat prior to his release of American Dream. Drake dissing someone for doing something that an artist that he shouts out on this record is just so funny with how backwards it is, and this was a sign of what's to come. And never mind what I said about the SZA bar being my favorite. My favorite part in this entire song is Drake sampling DJ Academic's iconic What Top 5 You Smoking On Kendrick? When the whole joke of that clip is that it cuts to act asleep to certified lover boy. Knowing the second half of that joke absolutely kills everything about this sample. It's hilarious. Then for some reason the beginning of Family Matters plays at the end, but we're not ready for that song yet. I also gotta say this. Hearing Drake trying to be threatening will never not be funny to me. And I haven't got the slightest of clues why this man thinks whispering like he's recording this at 2am next to his parents' bedroom and trying not to wake them up is the delivery to go when being threatening. It's an absolute joke. Oh, and the backstage in my city it was friend zone is just confusing. I think he's trying to say that it's all fake and people are friendly to his face, but using an incel term to explain it is just so stupid. Genius has the Japan bar say that it's all a subliminal shot towards some woman that him and Future are beefing over, which... What a surprise. Drake randomly dissing women for no apparent reason. Imagine my shock. It's shit like this and that random Megan Thee Stallion bar that makes it so easy to hate Drake. Anyways, I find push-ups to be boring and a pretty weak diss if I'm being real. If this is great for Drake's standards, then dear lord, the bar is in hell. And it really shows that he was out of his league trying to go against Kendrick. I mean, I get it, after he slithered out of the Pusha T disc, he would look even more pussy had he tried to do the same. And him actually stepping up did lead to my favorite song of the year, so I could thank him for that. I won't, but I could. Oh god, how did I forget about the bar about Whitney? Drake, do you not learn from your actions? You trying to let this shit die down, nah, 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 not this time, you following through. So a week after push-ups, Drake used the same tactics as he did with his Meek Mill beef and dropped a second diss track. The difference is, this was whack from the start. 
As we all know, the track features Drake using AI to rap as Tupac and Snoop Dogg, and from the moment I heard about this, I thought this was awful. I straight up felt like I was going insane watching people laugh at this, going, <laughs> Drake's such a troll. I spent months hearing about how horrible and terrifying AI is, to then see a bunch of people parading Drake around for resurrecting a dead legend to diss Kendrick. And since then, to now, I've been so against this. It's one thing for some random kid in his bedroom to play around with an AI voice filter, and it's another for a multi-million dollar 37-year-old celebrity with several Grammy Awards and way too much influence to use a fucking Tupac AI voice filter. It's so childish and distasteful, and I was laughing my ass off when the Tupac estate rightfully forced Drake to take it down. I didn't even listen to him until making this video for those exact reasons. And I wasn't missing out on anything. Let it be known that the first time Drake's weird behavior with underage or barely legal women being brought up in this battle was from Drake himself. That's fucking weird. And no, this isn't a B-Rabbit situation. If y'all actually listen to that verse, the things he brings up are stuff like his race, his living situation, his poverty, dumbass friend, getting cucked, things he can't really control. Not to mention it's also from a fucking movie. But yeah, you can't really do anything about being white or someone fucking your girl. Uh, you can, however, not text a 14-year-old I miss you or grope, objectify, and sexualize a 17-year-old girl on stage in front of a giant crowd. These are not the same. And he throws in that heard it on the button podcast has gotta be true, as if this hasn't been a topic of conversation since 2018. As if Millie Bobby Brown and Billie Eilish themselves didn't out Drake for his weird behavior. I've had that clip of that 17 year old locked in a Discord chat since 2021. None of this shit is just rumors I heard on a podcast. It's all evidence of him being a fucking weirdo. That bar is 37 seconds into this song, and it's still downhill from here, with Drake mentioning several times about how it's taking Kendrick too long to release. Ooh, it's been a week and you haven't dropped. You just trying to slither out of this. Something something Taylor Swift. It took Drake three weeks to respond to like that, and he can't even handle waiting a week. He's got the attention span and the patience of an iPad kid. And the Taylor Swift mention is yet another instance where Drake contradicts himself because he tries to diss Kendrick in saying that he has to wait to release his response because Taylor Swift dropped an album. And then he follows that up with, I moved my album when she dropped. So who is it, Drake? Is it Kendrick that Taylor's topping or is it you? Because it sounds like it's you. Oh, and you better have a quintuple entendre on that shit. Some shit I don't even understand is hilarious in hindsight. A quintuple entendre isn't even something that he has to do to get you to not understand the lyrics. Apparently you couldn't even understand something as explicit as Mother Eyes Sober, but I digress. The song was trash from the get-go and continues to be trash. There's nothing you can say to convince me otherwise. Now let's move on, cause I gotta cleanse my ears of this shit. Why would I call around trying to get turtle on niggas? Y'all think of my life is rap? That's whole shit, I got a son to raise, but I can see you don't know nothing about that. One random ass Tuesday, I see FT Signifier in my subscription feed talking about how it was all over after the YNW Melly bar, and I was confused on what the hell he was talking about, until I quickly found out that it was a reference to a new track, by Kendrick. Kendrick finally dropped, and I had to hear it immediately. And hear it I did, and continued to do so. About 90 times, in fact. <laughs> this right here is the reason why I'm making this video, because I have been obsessed with this song since the moment I heard it. My last FM says I've only played it 36 times, and I heavily disagree with it, because that's way too low. Of course, it only factors Spotify plays and not YouTube plays, reaction videos, or the entire six minute song playing in my head on repeat for several weeks in a row. Where the hell do I even begin? The track opening with a sample of Richard Pryor saying everything they say about me is true. The title of the song being called Euphoria, which could be a reference to that show where high schoolers are over-sexualized that Drake has a producer credit on. I had no fucking idea he had a producer credit on it until this song, by the way. I mean, it's very fitting for Drake. The song having three beat switches when Kendrick said on Like That, I hope it comes with three switches. Kenny opening up the song with a nice little jazz sample as a beat to throw everyone off before it goes into an absolute fucking banger of two beats for the rest of the duration. Those horns coming in right after Kenny's haunting delivery of don't tell no lie about me and I won't tell truth about you goes so fucking hard. The countless flows, Kendrick playing with his voice as he usually does, the constant switches of rhyme schemes, the fucking endless quotables that have had me in a goddamn headlock for months. Beep, 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 beep. 
What is it, the brakes? Push a T. I don't give a fuck about who you're hanging with. You're my first one, like my last one. It's a classic, you don't have one. Some shit just cringe-worthy. You ain't even gotta be deep, I guess. I hurt your feelings, you don't work with me no more. Okay, don't speak on the family, Crody. You know what, you ain't like that record? Back to back, I like that record. You can get deep in the family, Crody. Now let me say I'm the biggest hater. I hate the way that you walk, the way that you talk. I hate the way that you dress. Talk about me and my family, Crody. I'm fine with it, I'll push the line with it. Someone go bleed in your family, Crody. He's Terrence Thor and I'm Terrence Crawford. Yeah, I'm whooping feet. I be at Newhall King eating fried rice with a dip sauce and a blammy, Crody. I can see you don't know nothing about that. Tell me your cheese and farm. Last one. Headshot for the year. You better walk around like Daft Punk. Remember, nobody never took my food. Way too many times would I be at work and just be muttering these lines to myself non-stop for hours. And that's not even hitting the tip of the iceberg. And the third line of the song is already calling Drake distasteful for tailor-made freestyle. He flips the use of the axe sample by mentioning the whole fucking punchline of the clip, saying Drake wants to be a killer, the park his son bar, using a Drake as a double entendre with his whole beef, let a Canadian make Pac turn his grave, literally warning Drake to keep this as a friendly fade and don't try to send more personal shots like he already did on push-ups. Mentioning how Drake is constantly sneak dissing everyone and everything, telling him he doesn't have a classic, and to let his core audience stomach that, then tell him where he gets his abs from, and then specifically mentioning a fucking V12 slimming machine, <laughs> saying Drake's the only one who likes to be famous, quoting DMX on two different occasions, telling him he cringes whenever he hears Drake use the N-word. <laughs> I don't think I have a definitive favorite bar, but one of them is definitely I believe you don't like women, it's real competition. I mean, it's goddamn facts with how whiny Drake's music has been for years and how much he complains about women just fucking existing. On top of him being too scared to diss Pusha T, but is more than happy randomly dissing women for no damn reason. Drake trying to act tough with the whole, the way you doing splits, bitch your pants might rip. And Kendrick just goes, show me your splits, I'll double back with you. You were signed to a dude who was signed to another dude who said he was signed to that dude. And this fucking killer piano plays right at the end of that that goes so damn hard for no reason. You were signed to a nigga that signed to a nigga that said he was signed to that nigga. Try cease and desist on I saw someone theorize that the piano was the same melody as Humble. And while I did try to hear if there was any similarities and couldn't, I like to make myself believe in that theory just so it sounds like Kendrick's telling Drake to sit down, be humble. Especially when the piano comes back when he drops out, I got a son to raise, but you don't know nothing about that. Which that part made me lose my shit on my first listen, that I had to pause the song and just recover from it. That made me so damn giddy. He even flips the 20v1 bar from Push Up, saying that it's a 1v20 because Kendrick's writing all his songs by himself while he's going against all of Drake's ghostwriters and then even name drops one of them. He even gives Drake a quadruple entendre in response to the use of AI. And I really fucking wish Genius Lyrics would fix this bar because Kendrick says Joel Hill Austin, not just Joel Austin. It's a way of combining the names of Joel Austin and Haley Joel Osment. And I absolutely love Tell Em Run to America to imitate heritage, they can't imitate this violence. I may not have grown up in the same conditions as Kendrick did. Violent neighborhoods and gang crimes were something I was never around. But is Canada infamous for having a school shooting or mass shooting every other week? I went like 30, 40 listens before I heard the ooh after that's something you don't want to do. Psst, that's something you don't want to do. Ooh. Like it's a shiver or a ghost sound and actually... Fuck whatever I said before. That's my favorite part of the whole song. It's so goofy and Kendrick-like, I fucking love it. That's how he ended the last verse. With a... Ooh. <laughs> and then there's the outro that I can't sing along to, but God is it hilarious that he tried to strip away Drake's N-word pass. There's still stuff in this song that I'm missing, but I'll bring them up later with how Drake tries to respond to this, because it really shows the brain rot level of media literacy that Aubrey has. Shit, and I haven't even mentioned just how smooth Kendrick flows all over this track. From the very beginning with that buttery flow over those jazzy guitars, to how he rides so perfectly on the beat with confuse themselves with real women. Cause they confuse themselves with real women. Or the make Pac turn in his grave bar. I'd rather do that than let a Canadian nickel make Pac turn in his grave. The way that the second beat drops out at the beginning of the verse and delays the drop. I love that both me and this dude on Tony's stream had the same reaction. Expecting it to drop on so okay because you can feel the bar naturally end on the four, but instead the acapella keeps going on and the beat drops on Joe, making it hit even harder because you had to wait for it. And I know I gave, and will continue to give Drake shit for repeating lines or rhymes while loving when Kendrick does it, 
The clear difference is the delivery. Kendrick plays with his voice and delivery to make it entertaining. He can rhyme Crody with Crody five times in a row, and it's still entertaining because of the way he's saying it, the way he's mocking the Toronto accent, while Drake rhyming down with now five times in a row in the same damn near monotone voice gets fucking boring really quick. That's why Euphoria is enjoyable for its entire six minute runtime because Kendrick doesn't spend a minute and a half using the same flow, delivery, and rhyme scheme. Fucking killing and burying it into the ground while still continuing to beat the shit out of it. He's constantly switching it up and the changing throughout it makes it so entertaining that the six minutes just fly by like it's three. I also love the cover art having one of the examples of using the word Euphoria be they had almost a week to recover from the Euphoria of Tuesday's series winning victory with how this song dropped on a Tuesday, and I'd argue Kendrick had already won with this alone, and then continued to keep on winning with every other release. And the battle was over almost a week after the song's release. So yeah, Euphoria is easily my favorite song in this entire beef, and my favorite song of the year. And we still got six more to go through, so we're at a really high point. Finally ready to play, have you ever, let's see, have you ever thought that OVO was working for me? Three days after Euphoria dropped, I woke up to a message from Jonas linking me to an Instagram post by Kendrick Lamar, which ended up being yet another diss track. He really did go back to back on Drake like he said he would, and it was already making that drop 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 talk become really funny. At the time when I heard it, I thought it was alright. Not bad in the slightest, but nowhere near the star shine that was Euphoria, which god knows how many times I had heard it up to this point. The beat was definitely a different direction, which would make sense given how this was done by Jack Antonoff. Wait, I'm sorry, who? Kendrick really got Taylor Swift's producer to make a beat for him in this beef, and then dropped it on Instagram like Drake did with Taylor made freestyle. <laughs> That's not even mentioning how the title plays in the Drake's timestamp series. 616 could be in reference to Tupac's birthday or that Father's Day of this year was on June 16th. And the fucking beat samples an Al Green song which apparently features Drake's uncle on guitar. All of this shit and we haven't even gone into the fucking song. <laughs> Do you see now why I love Kendrick? This man undoubtedly put a lot more thought into this whole beef than Drake did. Getting into the song, I love the intro with that beautiful synth line and Kendrick singing. Even saying that he could see somebody lying, which he brought up in the intro for Euphoria, how Drake's a master manipulator and that he'll fabricate stories about his family because of Mr. Morale. I loved how during the pop-out concert, Kendrick changed this line to, I guess somebody lied. I guess somebody lied. Smells like somebody lied. The first verse doesn't really have anything to do with Drake, and it's more of a typical rap track mixed with some poetry and then a confession to God? I'm sorry, what? Yeah, so Kendrick prays to God and confesses to him about he's gonna go to war, which is just crazy to do on a diss track. And little did we know how much of a warning this was gonna be for what was to come, nor did it prepare us at all for it. Initially, I was a bit iffy on this for how little he seemed to rhyme, but looking at it now, I was so fucking wrong. There I was thinking he's rhyming fantasize with correspond, not fallen sky with fantasize, and immobilized, and then somehow making correspond fit in with all that. Kenny once again comes in with great flow switches, my favorite part probably being Remember when you picked up a pen, never stayed up in trust, Jimmy so staring on the rags and where I was from often. The way he just leads into that where I was from often just sounds so goddamn satisfying. Put my children to sleep with a prayer, then close my eyes, definition of peace, is a great line to throw in the beginning given what he says later in the track. Which, let's get into that. After this first verse that doesn't feel that focused on anything, we get a second one that is definitely focused. Immediately coming in with a shot towards academics, which I love. Not only because of how much of a dick rider Ak is and was during this entire thing, or just fuck Ak in general, but also with that information that came out soon after the beef. He calls out Drake for harassing random innocent people on Kendrick's team and how there's no points in doing that, and then drops the fucking bomb of calling back to the Have You Ever bars on Euphoria to tell Drake, Have you ever thought that OVO is working for me? That the people on his own team has it out against him and isn't in support? That they think he deserves all this? Mentions that Drake's been putting money out in the streets trying to get dirt on Kendrick, something he kind of alluded to on Euphoria as well, but Drake can't get anything because, to quote Kendrick, I have a boring life. I love peace, which is just chef's kiss. Kendrick went silent for five years between Damn and Mr. Morale, getting therapy and healing himself, and then came back to show us his trauma and bones in his closet, and in the two years since that album, we didn't really hear much from him outside of doing some shoves. Hell, even after this beef, the only thing we've heard about Kendrick is seeing him speak at a Compton school graduation, and then there was a pop-out concert in the Not Like Us music video. Other than that, silence. 
Meanwhile, there is too much shit about Drake that I know about. There's the weird shit with minors, which I will continue to drill in this video because even back in 2020, I did not like this shit was being played like it hasn't happened. And even recently, there was the whole shit with Drake shouting out and supporting that predator on kick that gets minors to expose themselves while lying to them about being filmed live. Ricegum really was a pioneer. <laughs> Hell, five years ago was when we found out Drake was a deadbeat. There's just so much shit that the public keeps learning about Drake. Meanwhile, Kendrick's just in the back, quietly living his life with his family. The can't Tootsie slide up out of this one is just going to resurface bar has aged like the finest of wines. He mentions how Drake was spending most of his beef making memes on Instagram instead of actually participating, doubling down on how his crew is against him, even mentioning Twitter bots, which is what happened with Pusha T, and it makes it even funnier when Drake and his fans try to act like Hendrix botting his plays. And then he ends the song with the kind of scathing, before you figure out that you're alone, ask what Mike would do. Bringing back the Michael Jackson comparison Drake keeps making about himself, while referencing how Michael passed away from his own doctor drugging him, as well as, and I'm gonna say allegedly to this because it's something that I've only heard from the internet, that Michael towards the end of his life had grown really paranoid and pushed out a lot of the people in his life. I don't know how true to that part is though, but if it is, then damn. What a cold line to end a song off. I also find the You're Not Alone to be kinda interesting given the ending of Meet the Grams. It's kind of as if, like, Kendrick tried offering an olive branch to Drake and be like, hey, you know, if you think about it, I could help you. I could give you some therapy. And then Drake was like, nah, actually, your wife is cheating on you when you beat her. And Kendrick was like, you lie. <laughs> yeah, 616 in LA is pretty good. Though in my ranking of Kendrick disses, it's probably at the bottom. Not in the way of it's the worst out of the four cases. They all hold each other up in their own way. But it's just the one that didn't really have the biggest impact as the rest of them. And quite honestly, when I recite the diss tracks Kendrick dropped, I continuously keep forgetting about this one. Oh yeah, the cover art is a cropped photo of a Maybach love. Whatever that means. <laughs> So the same night as 616 was released, Drake finally dropped his big red button nuclear bomb of a track that he had kept teasing on Instagram. And I'm just gonna go ahead and say it, this shit is fucking ass. This is definitely all from hindsight, but also because I didn't listen to this when it dropped. I didn't even know about it until after a specific track that we'll talk about, you know the one. And it doesn't help that I heard this after having heard that track, but even then, I could never get past the beginning of the first verse because I would get so fucking bored. It took me maybe four attempts until I could finally get through the seven minute track, and by then the beef had already been over. I think the pop out concert probably already happened. But yeah, I'm not gonna shy away from my final verdict on this. I think this shit sucks as a diss track in so many ways, and I constantly see people say that this is good. Are we listening to the same song? The only good things about this track is the third beat, because as usual with Drake, the best part of his songs are the beats. It's almost as if he prioritizes the sound and catchiness of a song while being shallow with the lyrics and delivery. As well as the opening, which is kind of funny given the ending of Euphoria, but even then Drake immediately ruins it by referring to his son as his seed, and then going, I gotta go bad, I gotta go bad. I gotta go back. We get the ending to push-ups, which I think is hilarious, that he starts off this nuclear red button diss track by bragging about his sex addiction and spending money on strippers. And that fucking annoying, he was really, really trying to keep it PG, which Drake saying he wants to try to keep it PG really doesn't sound good given the type of girls he likes to talk to. We get to the first verse that almost immediately bores the fuck out of me because he uses the same rhyme scheme and almost same flow for a minute and a half straight. And isn't it funny how Kendrick literally told him he doesn't give a fuck about who he hangs with? So Drake responds by opening his verse talking about all the people he hangs with. Of course, it was hilarious seeing YG show up to the pop-out concert given this line, but also Drake shouts out fucking Chris Brown of all people. And on the same song that he tries to accuse Kendrick of beating Whitney, again, it's this fucking contradictory shit that plagues every single track from Drake during this beef that makes him a fucking joke. Yes, beating women is bad, but how are you gonna act like it's bad and you're so against it when you open up the song shouting out a notorious woman beater? Drake using the words fake T makes him lose any ounce of tough guy and just makes me think of that I believe you see two bad bitches bar on Euphoria. After that is his line about him not being a rat, which I can only think is him trying to respond to the gunna bar, which even though that line is obviously calling Kendrick a snitch if he were to talk about the shit he knows about Drake, I can see Drake taking it as Kendrick calling him a snitch because Hopper proves time and time again in this battle that he has the media literacy of a fetus. Ten bars in and we get the absolute mind-baffling bar that is always rapping like you about to get the slaves free. Drake, what is bad about trying to free slaves? Hmm? 
I would love to know. Having this after that equally abysmal whipped and chained like American slaves bar off of For All the Dogs is just a mind-numbing realization of how little self-awareness Drake has. Now I follow that up with the first of many lines about Kendrick, saying that he's just acting like an activist and doesn't actually give back to his community. Of course, he has to say it in the corniest way possible, but anyways, it's still a blatant fucking lie that one Google search proves are wrong. And then we can't even catch a fucking break because we follow this line with Drake showing the absolute lack of literacy he has by responding to the we hate the bitches you fuck because they confuse themselves with real women line by for some ungodly reason bringing up race. Now I've thought about this line from Euphoria and what it could possibly mean for a while now. It is a standout line for not great reasons. The only two interpretations I've been able to come up for it is him saying that Drake fucks sex workers and quote-unquote slutty women and that's why they're not real women, which is pretty fucking misogynistic. Or the other way I thought about it is a reference with his weird behavior with minors and that Drake likes to have relations with girls who are barely legal, but just because they're 18 doesn't make them real women in the case of women who are in their 20s or 30s or fucking anywhere near Drake's age. Either way you want to look at this line, I don't see how you could look at it and go, hmm, but you see, I fuck women of all races. <laughs> and of course, Drake doubles down by saying that Kendrick's the black messiah, wifing up a mixed queen, and then bringing up him having sex with white women that we already fucking knew about, because we listened to Mr. Morale. It was the third goddamn track. Y'all Drake fans want to talk about how that bring up how he likes children bar was an eight mile moment, but Mr. Morale was truly an eight mile moment. Two years before this whole shit even started, Kendrick was telling the world unprovoked that he was cheating on his wife with white women and that he thought he was a racist because he was doing it as an act of revenge for his ancestors. We already knew about this and yet Drake's trying to act like this is some big revealing information. And I'm not condoning what Kendrick did, but him having consensual sex with a woman for his own fucked up reasons and having a lust addiction is not really the same as objectifying, sexualizing, and groping a 17 year old on stage in front of a crowd. What in the goddamn? Ugh. Oh my god, and we're only a minute into the song. Drake ignores Kendrick's advice and goes straight in on focusing on his family, saying that him and Whitney are out of love and haven't been since their late teens. Drake, I don't know why you feel the need to bring up the teenage stage of these two adults. I know they were a thing in high school, but maybe try avoiding anything relating to teenagehood given what's been brought up about you. As well as bringing up Kendrick's son and how he's never with him, I guess. And then that Whitney's captions are always screaming, save me. Drake. Why are you basing your information on this relationship on Instagram captions like a goddamn high schooler? And the way he says we could have let the kids out of this, don't blame me. Like, I know he's trying to reference the I got a son to raise bar, but that wasn't about Adonis. It was just about Drake's lack of being a father. And Drake replies to that by going, yeah, well, why don't you take pictures with your son? He probably does. He just doesn't have to prove it to the internet because he wasn't the one who got outed for being a deadbeat hiding his child until he could use him for monetary gain. And then we get Drake's schizo posting about how Whitney had an affair with Kendrick's creative partner, Dave Free, by having the most cringe, unlistenable four seconds in the entire song. Day free. What the hell made you think this sounded good? Who the fuck was standing in the studio hearing Drake record this and saying, yeah, yeah, he going off. This goes hard. I would be standing there wincing into oblivion thinking, what is this man doing? Which is what I do every time I have to hear this portion of the song. And we get the first of a few moments in this beef where Drake tries to act like he's smart. He does this like three separate times where he drops some dumbass thought and then goes, this is making plenty sense. I'm really getting what's going on. Like, no, Drake. No, you don't. Then he randomly starts telling Whitney to shake her ass for him and Dave Free, which is wildly out of pocket. And he can't even have this barely clever bar about shake that ass for free sit as its own double entendre because he's then got to explain that, well, you know, not free as in money, but like Dave Free, get it? Yeah, we got it. It's not that hard to understand. Maybe for you and your audience it is, but for the rest of us it was pretty fucking obvious. Then he drops a couple more short jokes, which just sound like playground humor at this point. And given the kinds of disses Kendrick was throwing out on Euphoria, saying, Haha, you short though, is just such a lame-ass response. And then out of fucking nowhere, Drake just disses Abel again for some reason. And he tries to be his usual fake threatening self, but following a bar about Abel singing with almost started reaching for my waist, makes me think you're about to start jerking off to Abel singing, not that you're gonna pull out a gun. <laughs> 
Then we go back to the chorus where he brags about his sex addiction before the beat switches. Drake tries to act threatening and it fails. And then we get what I can't call the worst verse because that's easily the first one, but what's easily the most fucking pointless verse on this whole song. Why is this here? Why are we interrupting your so-called red button response with you just going off on Rick Ross, The Weeknd, and ASAP Rocky? You got Kendrick over here fucking bodying you and you're like, yeah, but um, I think your wife's cheating. Anyway, Rocky's talking shit, Rick Ross fat, let me say the n-word a bajillion times. Okay, so you know how my brain gets a little overthinky a lot? Yeah, that's been kicking in since the What's the Dirt controversy, which I'll just go ahead and say I think his take is very fucking stupid and misses the entire point. Like, the point of Drake using the word a bunch of times in this song, and especially in this section, is solely just to make Kendrick cringe. I don't know how you get any other meaning other than that. Kendrick said he finds it cringe when he uses the word and he doesn't want him to say the word anymore. Therefore, Drake is a little rebellious child and he's like, I'm gonna say it a bunch of times. I'm gonna make you cringe. That's the entire reason. I only brought this up as like a little comment of annoyance, not because I find the idea of a rapper using the word a bunch of times to be annoying. I don't. I've never understood that argument because it's their word. They can use it as much as they want to use it. It's just the fact that Drake using it a bunch of times gets really annoying because it's Drake and everything that man does annoys the fuck out of me. <laughs> the delivery and flow is garbage in my opinion. It just sounds like Drake talking rattling off this bloated ass verse. At one point he just repeats the which one of my so-called n-words three times before actually finishing the bar which just comes off to me as filler. Which this whole fucking verse feels like filler. The ASAP Rocky diss is also funny to me because I'm sorry the internet may tell me that Drake and Rihanna dated at one point but after watching her curve his ass several times on camera I do not believe it for a fucking second. After a bunch of bullshit, we finally get another diss towards Kendrick, and it's yet another blatant fucking lie. How are you gonna say with a straight face that Baby Keem is ghostwriting for Kendrick when one, it's a proven fact that it's the other way around, and two, Baby Keem was making Minecraft videos when Kendrick wrote Good Kid and T-Pab. And then we get a third beat switch, which makes me think he just tried doing a Euphoria but failed miserably at it because he couldn't stay on topic, nor could he make these seven minutes anywhere near as enjoyable as Kendrick's six minutes. But we go back to dissing Kendrick, opening up with a line that I cannot take seriously as a diss because it just sounds like Drake being bitter about Kendrick having more Grammys than him. Drake tries to claim that Kendrick called up the Tupac estate to get him to take down TaylorMade Freestyle, which given how you've already lied several times on the song, I can't believe this one either. But also because it's not that far-fetched to believe that the estate wouldn't be too happy with using AI to resurrect a dead man. Plus, the guy currently running had worked for Interscope and signed Tupac to the label back in 1989. Tupac's family probably has communications with the estate, and if anybody was going to ask them to get them to take it down, I would believe a family member would do it before Kendrick doing it. And when they did go to take it down, they also cited that they didn't like having Pac's voice on something disrespecting Kendrick after all the good he's done for the estate. There is plenty of reasons to think that the estate heard the disrespect that was Taylor made freestyle and thought, hey, how about don't fucking do that? Instead of, ha ha ha, Kendrick made him take it down because he in love with Pac. Drake. Then once again shows his horrendous media literacy by saying Kendrick's dad got robbed by Top when it only takes a working brain cell to read the lyrics on Duckworth and realize the fucking opposite happened. Then this bar just comes out of bumfuck nowhere. It's only big D in this video proof. What? Um, yes, honor relevance? Like, no, really, what? This is just a stupid bar that comes out of nowhere, and I don't see how it can be taken as a good diss in the slightest. Or even as a diss in general. Haha, <laughs> I have a big dick, remember that leak? Oh, he immediately follows this up talking about... their kids. I don't know why, this is just making me think of that gunna line. Wait. What did Kendrick say again? Wait, I know some shit about niggas that make gunna wanna look like a saint. This <laughs> Nah, for real though. Drake says that Kendrick doesn't want to be around people not blacker than him, which is just a wild take and Hoppery showing his insecurity again. And we're getting bars like this and referencing one of Kendrick's best songs and mentioning Snoop Dogg and mentioning Tupac. This is getting very repetitive at this point. Then we get into the actual big allegation of the track, that Kendrick beats Whitney. Of course, these are allegations. We do not know. I cannot confirm or deny anything. 
What I can say is, I am very inclined not to believe Drake, given the several times he has lied on this very track, and will continue to lie later on in this beef. And unlike Drake's weird relations with minors and barely legal women, there isn't really anything to show that Kendrick is beating Whitney. In fact, there's a little bit of the opposite in her brother publicly supporting Kendrick, which several normal human beings with siblings have said that if someone was beating their sister, they would not be publicly supporting them, but it's of course not concrete evidence to prove anything, just something to think about. Drake brings up Kendrick moving to New York, once again trying to spin this narrative that Kendrick's the serial cheater, when if you listen to Mr. Morale, you know that he did cheat on his wife during touring, and even saying that Whitney was already out of the picture. Oh, hey, look at what song that information's on. He brings up that the couple has been proposed since 2015, but not actually married, which... Yeah, I guess that's a little weird, but... Who cares? They're two adults with their complicated life, and in the end, I don't think their marriage matters that much when they got two children to raise together. And again, in 2022, Kendrick did say... But Whitney's gone. By the time you hear this song, she did all she could. I also find it funny that Drake puts this little thing about Kendrick digging for dirt when Kendrick already said on Euphoria... Why would I call around trying to get dirt on niggas? Y'all think of my life as rap? That's whole shit. I got a son to raise, but I can see you don't know nothing about that. And the digging for proof is cheap coming from the guy making allegations and providing zero proof. I'm starting to get really fucking tired of this song. We got some corny bar about Michael, which leads Drake into the second time he acts like he's smarter than he is, while making this comparison that Michael Jackson prayed for his skin disease so people would think he was white, and this makes Kendrick Michael Jackson because his label would make him get on pop records and rap for the whites. I... Uh... What? You know... I can't confirm or deny that Michael Jackson was praying that he'd become white, but I don't think Kendrick featuring on a Taylor Swift song in 2015 makes him wish people believed he was actually white. This comparison doesn't even make a damn bit of sense. I am baffled as to how Drake came up with any of this. Then we go into a claim about how Kendrick told J. Cole to leave the beef. I'm aware that I have not talked about 7 Minute Drill at all in this video, and I won't. Because Cole left the beef for a reason, and as we all know, it was the best choice he could have made, and if Kendrick did tell him to exit after this beef, then good thing he did. Then Drake just goes way off topic, whispering about going to Delilah with all of his ice. Which sounds like filler and makes me sit there thinking, what are you doing? And hearing it after fucking Wangwan Delilah, it makes this part even worse. And then there's that fucking amazing moment of him going, you dang. You did. You did. Which... <laughs> yeah. I mean, we all know this part aged like fucking milk. It wasn't even good to begin with, but it aged horrendously. And finally, I'm done with this song. Not only did I want to talk about this beef just to gush over the Kendrick tracks, but also because a part of my obsession with this beef is just how bad I find these disses from Drake are, and how fucking stupid he was during this whole thing, with Family Matters being such a big offender. Even if what happens in 20 minutes never happened, I do not see how anybody could find this to have been good. Would it have gotten big? Yeah, probably, it's Drake. But I still would have been sitting there wondering how anybody is finding any of this to be a good diss track, let alone a fucking nuclear red button. And I'm gonna stop here for a moment because if Drake is perfectly okay with using an AI voice of a dead man, then fuck it, I'm gonna talk about the gay parody of this third section, how it's better than the entire song. Kendrick is up in his mouth. And I'm about to put my dick in it right now, then I put it in his ass. I am not joking. Whenever I hear Kendrick just open his mouth, my only follow-up is I'm about to put my dick in him right now. <laughs> and honestly, it's better than the actual bar. At least he's being dominating instead of crying about Kendrick having more Grammys than him. And I've genuinely got a lot of that verse stuck in my head several times. It's truly something that had Drake genuinely dropped instead. He probably would have won, because how the fuck do you respond to that? I'd imagine Kendrick would just be sitting there stunlocked, having no idea that this is where Drake would have taken the beef. Comparing showing how to give someone head to follow my lead like father like son is so wildly out of fucking pocket. And Drake was already doing this, 
Just not to this extreme. Even the best melody in the original song is improved. Honestly, I like singing those lyrics more than the original. They already know that I wanted your buns. They know that I turned it to cinnamon buns. And Jesus fucking Christ, it even manages to make the big D line work. You know the sex so good. I just make the end of video proof. At least mentioning your dick size makes sense when the whole verse is talking about being gay and fucking Kendrick. But yeah, anyways, Family Matters sucks. It's not a good diss, it's bloated to all hell, and it takes forever to get through the seven minutes in comparison to the breeze that is Euphoria. Okay, let's talk about you. So as I alluded at the beginning of Family Matters, I listened to Meet the Grams first. I think I was just laying on my couch watching TV when I probably saw reaction videos of the song being recommended, which meant I had to listen to it immediately. I've seen several reaction videos on this. I was watching every FD Signifier video that came out during this beef, and I can confidently say that I had the complete opposite reaction of what it seemed for most people. Now to be fair, I was not under the same context as everyone else, going from Family Matters to immediately meet the Grams and having to survive it. I was going from Meet the Grams and then finding out afterwards that Drake had dropped 20 minutes before this. So needless to say, given how giddy Euphoria had made me, I was grinning ear to ear when I heard this. This shit was so goddamn diabolical. <laughs> While everyone else was freaking out over that opening line, I heard it and I was like, yo. And then that condom line hit and I was just laughing. I cannot help but grin while listening to this. It's just absolutely insane. Writing a letter to Drake's son about how you feel bad for him, that his dad is Drake, so you'll be one for him, and calling out everything that Drake does, including getting pissed on the leg and letting that happen. Another mention of Drake's soon to be referred to as colonizing, mentions of his sex addiction and use of sex workers, bringing up how Drake had been hiding his baby mama before Pusha T let that and Adonis' existence be known. Telling Adonis to get a gym membership and just in general up lifting him. Then we go into a letter towards Drake's parents, telling them about Drake's behavior towards women and how he treats them, telling his dad that he raised a horrible person, tells his mom that he thinks Drake's a sick man with sick thoughts and should die, which like, those are valid thoughts, but to tell his mom? <laughs> Kendrick then drops this fucking horrifying bar about there being sex offenders on OVO that he pays and keeps Adonis around, which is some heavy allegations that have not been confirmed or denied. But there is also the Baca case that exists. That's all I'm saying. Baca got a weird case. Why is he around? <laughs> the bar about leaking videos of themselves to further push their agenda always makes me think of, you know, the leak. Which, given the line before it, and in general, this whole fucking song, is a nice little response to that Big D bar, and is really showing that Kendrick was right about the mole on 616. That was already kind of obvious with the dropping this 20 minutes later, but also with the mention of Drake using Ozympics, which was a bar in Family Matters that I didn't mention, where Drake claims Rick Ross is using them. The cover art of the song shows bottles of what I've heard are Ozympics, but I can't confirm or deny that. Oh yeah, the cover is also a zoomed out photo of the 616 in LA photo. That mole information looking more and more true. <laughs> Continuing on, we get probably my favorite line in the song. Ever since all the information of Drake's weird relations, and in general how misogynistic his music has been for years, it's made me wonder why he even has women fans. Why any woman would want to listen to an artist that doesn't say shit like this, and to hear Kendrick kind of repeat this rhetoric just feels really pleasing. Pretty much in the same way as this whole battle has, hearing Kendrick hate the fuck out of Drake and give us multiple anthems for Drake hating just feels very justifying. The third verse is written towards an unknown daughter, which I know Drake fans are very keen on bringing up how Kendrick lied about this. It was the only thing Drake immediately denied on his Instagram when the song dropped, of course in his trolling fashion. It's interesting that this is the only thing he denied at the time and nothing else. Moving on, yes, Drake fans, you are correct. The daughter has not been confirmed. There is a one article about the woman who was pregnant with Drake's kid, which would make the child 11 years old, like Kendrick says in the song, but who knows. All I'm gonna say is that the daughter is not the only point of the song. Everything else in this song is about things that clearly Drake does do, given several pieces of evidence. For all we know, Kendrick wrote this entire verse based off of that article that I just mentioned. But a lot of everything else he mentions, you can see Drake doing with your own eyes. So this one little verse does not negate the rest of the song. 
Anyways, we then get the final verse, which is the most cutting one, being written to Hobbery himself. If you're wondering why I keep calling him Hobbery, I read a comment where someone called him Hobbery Weinstein, and I love it so much. <laughs> Kendrick basically just looks in Drake's soul and destroys him for everything he is, while throwing him a little bit of life advice. It's basically Kendrick channeling his inner Pusha T, but to a terrifying level. Especially when you get to the You Lied parts, which unfortunately didn't have the full effect on me, given how I was listening to it through my soundbar. But whenever I do hear it with headphones, it does send a chill down the back of my neck. And he is right during that whole section. Why believe Drake when he's lied about all these things and the several other lies on Family Matters? 37 but you showing up as a seven-year-old is pretty fitting not only given Drake's constant trolling but he's also got the comprehension of one and Kendrick ends the song with one of maybe if not the coldest mic drop of all time I would say the song is iconic from the get-go with everything leading up to it and the way it dropped 20 minutes after Family Matters something that I don't think has ever been done before or the fact that I don't think there's ever even been a diss track in hip-hop history that was ever written like this as many people have said, this shit sounds like Kendra got Drake and his whole family tied up and he's just walking around them while saying all this shit. It's haunting, terrifying, and makes my fucked up side very giddy. It's not something I ever listen to often. I've probably heard 616 in LA more than this, but for what Kendrick says and does here, I just love it. Even if it took the battle into a very ugly place. Well, actually technically before this, Drake was trying to call Kendrick a woman beater. And his wife a cheater. So... Just saying. <laughs> There's also the fact that after this dropped, I went to work and one of my coworkers who I had overheard getting explained about this beef one day, back when I think push-ups came out, had finally asked me what side I was on, and without missing a beat, I said, Kendrick, been Team Kenny since like that. <laughs> Speaking of work, why you trolling like a bitch? Ain't you tired? Trying to strike a chord, and it's probably a minor. I can still remember it like it was yesterday. A stressful work day, soloing the floor, losing my sanity, hating everything. Finally got put on my last break, head into the back, sit down, load up YouTube, and the first thing I saw was Not Like Us, released four minutes ago. I listened to it. My break soon ended shortly after, and I was back onto the floor. But instead of being angry and stressed out, I was giggling to myself for two hours straight because I had certified lover boy, certified <laughs> and trying to strike a chord, and it's probably a minor <laughs> stuck in my head. I don't really know what I could say about the song that hit number one on Billboard, that broke records last set by Drake, has roughly 543 million streams, and was performed at the pop-out show six times in a row. It's a fucking catchy-ass bop. Euphoria is still my favorite out of the four, just for how it sounds the most of a classic diss track and has the most bars and punchlines, and it's the most Drake hater anthem for me personally. But Not Like Us is an easy second. It's a great anthem, especially for the West Coast. Continues to have several quotables that'll get me in a headlock. Damn, certified lover boy, certified. Fuck them all in the mama. Devil is a lie, he is 69, God say Drake. I hear you like I'm young. Well, over your foe, the other vaginal option. Pussy, beat your ass and hide the Bible if God watching. Step this way, step that way. He a fan, he a fan, he a fan. Party at the party, playing with his nose now. He has all eyes on me and I'ma send it up the pot. Baka got a weird case, why is he around? You run to Atlanta when you need a few dollars. No, you're not a colleague, you a fucking colonizer. OV ho, OV ho. Get his face tatted like a bitch apologizing. Roll their ass up like a fresh pack of zop. The audience not dumb. Shape the stories how you want. Hey, Drake, they're not slow. Why you trolling like a bitch? Ain't you tired? Trying to strike a chord, and it's probably a minor. And you know damn well I can't hear the DJ Mustard producer tag the same anymore. <laughs> I remember getting so hyped when I heard that Kendrick had 10 total diss tracks lined up for Drake and was honestly hoping for the battle to just continue just to get more anthems. And the third verse is fucking beautiful with how Kendrick just stops in the middle of his diss bop to give a history lesson just to bring it back to Drake's a fucking colonizer. And I got to learn a little bit of history about Atlanta. I do not remember hearing any of this in school. <laughs> Watching the crowd at the pop-out yell out and hold that A minor for so long, six times in a row, was legendary. The music video dropping on the 4th of July was amazing, and I've probably watched the thing about 10 times. It is full of so many references and symbolism and such an ode to Compton. The ending where Kendrick's family pops up during the Family Matters bar and Whitney's fucking crip dancing in a white beater is just goddamn chef's kiss. 
Talking about the song of my coworker and him explaining to me the John Stockton bar because he's a basketball fan is a core memory for me. But by far, my favorite moment and the reason why I can't believe the whole Kendrick's botting the plays claim in the slightest was working at the drive through window and hearing across the street some guy at the stoplight playing Not Like Us. Hearing that song out in public, in the wild, and not just on the internet was fucking surreal for me, and I could not stop laughing about it for the rest of the day. I even had someone else come through the drive-thru and was playing in their car, and I had only noticed it right when they were driving away. These are now memories I get to keep for the rest of my life thanks to this song, and just this whole battle. Fucking no wonder it's become my personal Roman Empire. This shit was an event. A once-in-a-lifetime opportunity that I got to live through, and I am so insanely happy that I did. This shit is garbage. This shit is trash. This is the most baffling response, and probably the most boring out of all the Drake tracks. I'm gonna be honest, I was on a roll when writing this video. I got 11,000 words in, 29 pages in, in mostly one sitting, and then I got to this song. It's been several days. I'm sitting here right now with the genius lyrics on one tab, the song on the other, and this script, and, and I, I just can't. I tried listening to the song and only made it 30 seconds in. I don't even know what I could possibly say that hasn't already been drilled in a hundred times before. Drake says Kendrick got his info from clowns and then literally three bars later says that he fed him the information. Three bars! Drake wrote the clown bar three filler bars, and then tried to spin the narrative while completely forgetting what he wrote down three bars ago. Not that in any scenario makes Drake contradicting himself okay, but I would have at least understood in some weird way if he had gotten maybe about halfway through the song and forgot that he had called the source of Kendrick's info clowns. But nah, he forgot that in the span of three fucking bars. Goldfish scientifically have a better memory span than Hoppery. And everyone's already brought up that if this was true, wouldn't Drake's first response to Meet the Grams be evidence of him planting this information instead of just trolling his way through the daughter allegations? Which I hope that's never forgotten about. The fact that the only thing Drake initially responded to was the verse about the daughter, and nothing about the sex offenders on OVO, the gambling problems, pill problems, sex addiction, body shaming, nope, just hehe, <laughs> but show me the daughter though. Nah, instead Drake had to go to the studio for two days to write an entire song about who he's- uh, God, it's so- I'm fucking stuttering trying to get through this, Jesus Christ. Instead, Drake had to go into the studio for two days to write an entire song about how he's too rich and famous to be a- <laughs> While still not acknowledging the other 13 points that Kendrick brought up. Then again, knowing how he would try to deny the- <laughs> Accusations, he'd probably be like, if I really do hate black women, why do I constantly fuck them, hmm? <laughs> If I really am bad with money, why am I not broken homeless? Did you think about that? Oh yeah, the third bar in the song is Hobry doubling down on the rat accusations. That were never made. Drake continues to act like a fucking high schooler with this why isn't Whitney denying the allegations? Why is she following Dave Free instead of Kendrick? Like, bruh, why are you basing your evidence on who follows who on fucking Instagram? How are you 37 years old and obsessing over Instagram follows and comments and using that as your evidence for Whitney cheating on Kendrick and Kendrick beating her? Like, bruh. Weeks after this entire battle, I heard a story about some drama that was between two of my coworkers that are both high schoolers, and I shit you not, it all started because one of them found and followed the other's girlfriend on Instagram. That is the literal bar for high school drama, and this is what Drake is doing for a couple of grown adults in their late 30s. It's great to know that in the span of Family Matters to this song, Drake went from showing up as a 7-year-old to showing up as a 17-year-old. There's a mention of Jeffrey Epstein, even though Kendrick compared him to Harvey Weinstein, and need I remind you, Drake was the one that brought up liking children in the first place. He tries to play it off as TikTok videos, as if Millie Bobby Brown and Billie Eilish weren't out here in 2018 telling the world what Drake was doing, or that video of the 17-year-old stage hasn't been around years before TikTok. Not even mentioning the insanity of thinking Kendrick's sitting at home watching TikTok drama videos and using that as his motivation for his disses. I know I'm not the only person to say this, because I'm pretty sure I heard Therapy say it first, but who the fuck genuinely thinks Kendrick even has TikTok, let alone watches it? The same dude who straight up said on his last album, I would never live my life on a computer. I actually get you life for a But no, yeah, Kendrick's totally using TikTok videos as evidence. Yes, totally. 
And then there's the infamous bars of Drake having fucking negative media literacy. Like, I genuinely cannot wrap my head around it. How do you hear Kendrick say twice that he was not molested and go, Haha, you were molested. And then fucking double, triple, quadruple down on that. Like, it's easy to think that this initial moment is all Drake says on the matter, but no! Not only does he misunderstand Mother I Sober while pretending for the third time that he's realized what's going on and that he's smarter than he actually is, but he just continues going on and on and on about how this is why Kendrick's calling him a p And then this really, really fucking corny and out-of-pocket bar about Mariah Carey's Touch My Body? And then he throws out this just absolute baffling take that he's too rich and famous to be a on the same fucking song where he mentions Jeffrey Epstein and R. Kelly. Isn't it just absolutely wild that Drake genuinely thought that Kendrick was molested? So his response to that was to just really hone in on it and make fun of him for it. I mean, this is the same guy that tried to diss Kid Cudi for being depressed and going to rehab, so it's really not that surprising. So, not only does Drake look like the biggest fucking idiot on the planet, but he's also just a giant piece of shit. A piece of shit. I swear to God, Twitter has better media literacy than Drake. And writing that, I challenged myself and decided to load up Twitter.com. I didn't search anything. I just scrolled down the whole page for like a minute. My burner account follows nobody. This is just the stuff Elon suggests to me. And I got to this video of a woman complaining about a book having words in it. Literally ranting about pages having so many words on them. Why are the pages so filled with so many words? Like, what the fuck? I like pages that aren't filled with this many words. Like, literally every page is like, like, look at this. Are you fucking kidding me? And even she probably has better media literacy than Drake. Cause at least never lied, but no one believed me when I said he didn't has 12 words. I'm sure she could figure that out. Obligatory, please don't go and harass this woman because for some fucking reason that has to be stated every single time someone talks about someone in a negative light on the internet. Anyways, moving on. Drake has a horrible response line to that legendary A minor bar by showing that he doesn't even understand music theory. B sharp don't exist. B sharp is C. C is in the A minor chord, you fucking dunderhead. The D major delivery gives the same cringe response as the day free on Family Matters. <laughs> I was gonna go on longer than that until my fucking voice was giving out, but I'm not gonna put you guys through that. <laughs> A random shot at Rick Ross for no reason. Random bar about being Whitney's screensaver for some reason. And then... Only fucking with Whitney's, not Millie Bobby Brown's. Oh my goodness! Okay, first off, as everyone has already ran into the ground, nobody brought up Millie Bobby Brown. Drake's the first to mention liking kids, and he's the first to bring up Millie Bobby Brown. It's absolute insanity. Who the fuck let this happen? And secondly, somebody on OV Ho desperately needs to show Drake that video of the 17-year-old. You never look twice at a teenager, but I guess you'll just sexualize and grope her on stage in front of a live audience. There's a bar about how Kendrick's view body not like us, which like I already mentioned, I find hard to believe when I've heard that song out in public several times. Oh my god, I never even seen this bar where he straight up says, I give a fuck about your streaming data? Drake, you fucking idiot, how do you not put a don't there? Jesus Christ! And apparently you very obviously do give a fuck about it when you mention it on this song and you had to mention it in someone's fucking Twitch chat. I genuinely believe Kendrick when he said that people on OV Ho like actually want his career to end, like think that he deserves this. Because who the fuck listened to him say any of this and didn't go, Drake, sit down. Like no, his ghostwriters and, and, and apparently the people that don't like him just sat in the back and was like, He's, 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 he's digging his grave, holy shit. This bar about the Spotify deleting R. Kelly music sounds like a good point until you realize Kendrick never even said this, it was Top Dog. I don't understand why these people praise us. I've been saying that about Drake for years. Album dropping soon, no wonder you turn to a clout chaser. As if Kendrick infamously has started a diss battle when he dropped Good Kid, and T-Pab, and Damn, and Mr. Morale. It's also been about four months since this battle at the time me writing this. And there still ain't a new Kendrick album. Most we've gotten is that teaser at the beginning of the Not Like Us video that we'll never hear a full version of, and rumors about a new album, but still nothing. Well, except for this! Whatever this is! 
What am I supposed to make of this? But of course, Drake can't possibly comprehend that maybe all of his shitty behavior throughout the last several years would lead to this moment. Or, given his lack of media literacy, I wouldn't be surprised if he couldn't understand the third verse on Not Like Us and just chalks it up to, he just dissing me because he's a clout chaser. That's not even mentioning that Kendrick is never on the internet and hasn't been for years. And after this battle, he just disappeared. And the only time we saw him again was giving a speech at a graduation ceremony. Yeah, total clout chaser. And the guy who's known for hopping on every single trend just to water it down, make the hit, and get a quick buck, calling the quiet dude a clout chaser, is fucking hilarious. <laughs> True high school bully energy. And then Drake takes a page from Nicki Minaj's book and ends this with a minute-long rambling monologue where he once again tries to act tough, but it fails miserably. You have no idea how many times I've made fun of the shit with some uh, good exercise. Good to get the pen out. Yeah, Drake, it was very obvious you got the pen out for the first time in a decade. Hell, Genius crediting Drake as a sole writer on Family Matters makes sense given how contradictory, full of lies, and blatant shit it is. And then there's my favorite part of this entire song, which was something a random comment pointed out. When he says everything in my shit is facts, the fucking beat follows it up with prove it. <laughs> everything in my shit is facts. Which is probably Boy Wanda trying to be clever, but it fails fucking miserably. And it just makes even the beat aware of Drake's constant lies. <laughs> this is the funniest shit in the whole beef, I can't. This song really showed the entire world that Drake is surrounded by nothing but yes men. Because what actual sensible person would allow someone to put this out? I know for a damn fact if I wrote anything as half as contradictory as this, Jonas would be calling my ass out from the fucking moment he hears it. I can't even get a video out without our shared overthinking brain cell kicking in and causing me to go back and rework everything, and I'm fucking glad that that's the case, because it's made everything better every time. And yeah, that's the entire song, it's shit, it's garbage, and I, I don't know what else to say other than it's shit and it's garbage. <laughs> I also want to give a little quick shout out to Illustrator Benny and this little animation video he made on the Heart Part 6 and all the worst parts about it because it is quite easily my favorite video to come out of this beef and I have seen this God knows how many times. <laughs> but that's not where the battle ends because just like any good movie, you gotta have the end credits. I didn't mention this, but all the way back on push-ups, Drake told Metro to shut his hoe ass up and make some drums, and that's exactly what he did. And god, was it amazing to watch in real time the impact of this battle. Because with the release of this beat, Metro put out a contest to have people hop onto it. And seeing the widespread of people that were on this, not only did you have American rappers, you had Spanish rappers on this, Japanese rappers on this. It didn't even stop at rap, it went into women singing over it. And then we didn't even need vocals anymore because Tim Henson just walked in with his guitar and shred a beautiful riff over it. Guitar not your style? Fuck it, saxophone. You know what, we don't even need music anymore. TikTok sketch about Drake getting plastic surgery. <laughs> Do y'all realize how fucking insane this is? The moment this beat dropped, the rap battle went so far out of rap just to hate on Drake. It was fucking hilarious. But I brought this all up, not just to talk about how out of genre this went, but to focus on one specific remix that I have loved to almost the same extent as the rest of Kendrick's diss tracks. And no, it's not the You Know Miles remix, I'm not gonna be shitposty with this. Nah, it was the Pack God remix. I've never heard of Pack God or Yumi until this remix, but dear god do they kill this. Especially Pat God. You know how I said that I'll just randomly get Kendrick's diss tracks stuck in my head or rap the entirety of Euphoria to myself? Yeah, same can go for Pat God's verse. I'll just be walking around in my house and randomly go, cause you a sex offender, semen spreader, gang banging, light pretender. My window's open, by the way. I'm saying all this shit, my fucking neighborhood can hear me. <laughs> I feel like someone walked by my house at one point and they're just hearing me talking about how Drake's about. <laughs> His flow is so catchy on this verse, and the bars are amazing. You straight out of Canada, my little maple leaf. He's so... I don't even know if there's a word to describe it. It sounds so condescending, and I know this next part is gonna sound like an insult, but I promise it's not. It sounds like Discord kitten talk. 
And just thinking about a random YouTuber talking to Drake like he's his little pet in a daddy-dommy relationship is so insanely fucking funny to me. <laughs> He even flips those put your hands on your knees bars from Family Matters and given the whole tone of this verse it ends up working and fitting in a lot more than it did on the original song. There's a fucking cupcake EDP bar that flows so well into dragging Drake on being a bad parent and then Pat God ends his verse with the fucking embarrassing quote. <laughs> oh my god I just I love this verse so much. Yumi's verse is pretty good as well. Not as good as Pack Odds in my opinion, but it's got some highlights like you as straight as some lesbian sex. <laughs> Calling Drake a predator man-child. I think my favorite part in his verse is when he just straight up says you rep the city nobody care about. Like, I don't know why, but him just saying nobody cares about Toronto is so fucking funny. I know this has nothing to do with Kendrick anymore. He's already gone raising his kids and shit, but I would not be able to make this video without talking about this remix. It is just as good as Kendrick's diss tracks, in my opinion, at least in terms of how much they're in my rotation. Woke up, looking for the broccoli. High key, keep a horn on me, that come my seat. Anyways, that's about it for the video. The only other thoughts I have about this battle is that the pop-out show was legendary, the Not Like Us video was amazing, and everything Drake has done since has been a constant reminder of how fucking horribly he lost. Like I threw out earlier, when that Sexy Red song released, my first thought was, when I see you stand by Sexy Red, I believe you see two bad bitches. And then when I read Drake's verse, all I could think of was he hates black women, hypersexualizes them with kinks of an info fetish. Reading his verse on Wang Wan, Delilah, and him saying, I'm so cheese, just made me think of tummy a cheese and fam. <laughs> Not to mention that he's literally getting upset over a woman having sex with someone that isn't him before him. Again. I believe you don't like women. And then it's hilarious that he put out that 100 gigabyte site, which not only is a horrible way to promote something given what's been said about Drake's relationship with minors, but also shortly after that was when all that info about the kick streamer and Drake supporting her started getting brought up, which apparently was shit that happened last year. Oh, and not to mention, I didn't even have this shit originally scripted because shit just keeps happening. The, the, the fact that like the three songs that he released from that project all featured artists from Atlanta. One of them, I guess, has him doing his fucking fake Pactois accent again. No accent and then, like, it doesn't even end there because I guess he put out, like, another three and one of them is straight up called Circadian Rhythms. I know that's a term before Kendrick used it, but come on, really? Really? Are you really gonna tell me you, you fucking titled the song Circadian Rhythms and did not expect anybody to think of Kendrick? Kendrick opened the casket shoved him in it, buried him six feet deep, danced on his grave, and Drake managed to dig through the bottom of the casket and continue digging deeper into the ground. This entire battle was iconic and euphoric as a Drake hater, no pun intended. After years of wondering why the fuck Drake was still popular, watching him just fall rapidly in fame has been amazing to revel in. And in general, just seeing the whole internet do a 180 on Drake after Meet the Grams Not Like Us to eventually BBL Drizzy being the beat that everyone hated Drake on felt so good after years of feeling a bit alone in hating the dude. And the funniest part is that video of Billie Eilish screaming the lyrics to Not Like Us. After seeing that, I was half expecting to end up seeing one of Millie Bobby Brown. <laughs> it just felt cathartic to see. I look forward to the new Kendrick album whenever that comes out. <laughs> Especially if it's anything like that snippet in the Not Like Us music video. Holy shit, that thing goes hard. And I won't lie, there's a part of me that is kind of looking forward to if Drake tries to release a new album, just to see what the internet will do. Because God, I hope to see the response just be a giant wave of... Trying to strike a chord and it's probably... And of course, everyone has their own opinion. But my opinion is the best opinion. I'm sure you figured that out already. Could I have a subscribe, please?